Okay, we're going to get started here in a moment. This educational program is intended for the personal, non-commercial use of its listener and may not be reproduced for any commercial purpose without the written permission of Rex Crandall and CALDA. The policies, positions, views and opinions expressed and or provided herein are not those of the State Bar of California, CALDA or any entity associated therewith, and are strictly those of the authors or speakers. No representations or guarantees of any kind are made with respect to the accuracy of the written, visual, oral or audio portions of this presentation and nothing herein should be relied upon to answer any legal questions. The written, oral or visual information expressed or provided herein should not be relied upon in dealing with any specific legal matter. No attorney-client or CPA-client relationship is created by any part of this educational program and related activities. Attorneys, CPAs or LDAs using the information expressed and provided herein in dealing with a specific client or clients, and their own legal matters should also research original sources of authority. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome again. We are going to go over uh, California real property tax and its state for inheritance tax today with Mr. Rex Crandall. Uh, a little information about him. Rex Crandall has been practicing law for 18 years and preparing income tax returns for more than 40 years. He has prepared thousands of tax returns for individuals businesses of all sizes, S and C corporations, LLC, trust and other types of organization. Rex is also registered as an enrolled agent to represent taxpayers before the IRS, US Tax Court, Franchise Tax Board and EDD. He is principal at his own firm which specializes in wills, trusts, durable power of attorney, advanced healthcare directives, probate law and taxes. So it is no surprise that the services often provided are the preparation of comprehensive, comprehensive estate plans and estate administration. Rex also belongs to several professional associations, including the Contra Costa Bar Association, CALDA, Cal CPA, and the National Notary Association. He enjoys giving back through community service. Currently, Rex teaches a free one-day course in fiduciary accounting through the Contra Costa County Public Law Library and also participates in the volunteer judge program. He also maintains a YouTube account where he posts videos on estate planning topics to make the information more easily accessible for everyone. Rex loves the outdoors. His favorite hobbies include hiking, camping, long distance, bike riding, fishing, and beekeeping. Needless to say, Rex Crandall is a very busy guy. So a little um, um, uh, house cleaning here. If you guys have any questions, make sure you go ahead and put them in the um, Q&A so we can keep track of those questions and get those answered for you. Okay, Rex, off to you. Okay, well, thank you for that fine introduction, Michelle DeJanae. I appreciate that. Now I know who I am. I, yeah. was I was wondering there for a while, but I'll get over that. So we're going to be covering a whole lot of material today. And hopefully I don't lose too many people. It's uh, real property taxation. We're going to do a overview of how to prepare real property deeds and a very overview of estate and inheritance tax, just so that people get an idea of what estate and inheritance tax is, so they know that 99% of the time, you don't need to worry about it, with our clients anyway. So the learning objectives, real estate taxation, that's your property tax you pay to the county how real estate is taxed in various situations, what happens on the death of a real property owner, and how Proposition 19 changed the landscape on beneficiaries receiving inheritance of real property. 
Um, what happens, how the property is assessed and how you claim the very beneficial parent-child exclusion for the beneficiary and what you should do if your real property values drop below what you're being taxed on. So before I get into each of the detail slides, I'd like to point out the class materials that I have made available to you. And there's quite a few this time, our multiple choice questions, the homework cover sheet, the class slides that we're talking about now. Your final exam is now available for you. And we'll cover the grant deed, preliminary change of ownership, and how people over 55 can sell their property and buy a new house and keep their old property tax assessment. The parent child exclusion, the parent grandkid exclusion when the parents of the grandkid are deceased, the required homeowners exemption to prove you live in the house, and then a brief uh, 35,000 foot view of inheritance tax returns. In um, doing estate planning, whenever you have a trust, as you know, you need to transfer assets to the trust. And I've included in the material a trust transfer deed. You could also call it a grant deed. And it's fairly straightforward. You fill it out who's requesting the, the deed, um, where the, you want the deed mailed back to. You always include the assessor parcel numbers. And these sections in here have to do with taxes they might collect when you are filing a deed. Basically, for an estate plan, what we normally do is we do, uh, you know, uh, Fred and uh, Wilma Flintstone grants to Fred and Wilma Flintstone as trustees of the Flintstone Trust. And then we describe where the property is located, and then we include a legal description, either as an attachment or in the body of the deed itself. We end up having to notarize it because you can't record it in the county recorder otherwise. And this is an example of an attached legal description. And you obtain the legal description, you always get the deed that was last recorded. So you can match up the details. It's really important to match up the name of the people that they're, how they're holding title now including middle names or middle initials or not, and before you grant it to the trust. And in addition, in this material I've made available to you, uh, a lot of the code sections that the county assessors use to evaluate how much tax they're gonna um, assess for recording the deed. And I've included information from several counties uh, around California for reference. Then in addition to the deed, when you go to record a deed, you have to file a preliminary of change of ownership report. We call it a PCOR. And what this, this is not recorded, although you send it to the recorder, it really goes to the assessor. And it gives the assessor a heads up whether or not they think they can assess your property with more property tax. It's pretty straightforward. Usually in estate planning, we're transferring assets from a trust creator for the benefit of the trust creator and or their spouse. They want to know things, why it should be an exempt transfer. Well, transfers to revocable trust are exempt. You give a little description about the property, maybe a single family resident and the condition of the property, I usually put fair to poor. And then the um, person creating the trust will sign as the transferor 
um, and the and the trustee when the document is filed. So it's not all that complicated. If you fill it out, you know, you you file it, you send it to the county recorder with your deed when you're recording, and then the county recorder sends it over to the assessor. And if you forget it, it's uh, a $25 fine from the recorder's office. So in the real property tax area, we've had a bunch of changes over the years, which will cover Prop 13, um, change of ownership, which causes reassessment, then the recent uh, Prop 19, which was a major change in uh, people being able to leave property to their children. Uh, it really caused a lot of tax problems. Then we have a parent-child exclusion, which is now very limited. And we'll cover the over 55 exemption where somebody over 55 has a low property tax. Now they sell the house, they buy another house and they move their old property tax assessment to their new property. And then we'll cover prop eight, which is when your market value drops, you wanna pay less tax for a while and you can do that until the market value comes back again. So Prop 13, uh, before Proposition 13, the county assessors were raising taxes all the time. I have an example from my father, Harry Crandell. He had always invested in rental houses and then bought an eightplex. He was trying to build up money for the future, for retirement. And the county kept on raising the taxes all the time without voter involvement. And it got so bad that he lost the eightplex on uh, foreclosure because of the property tax. And then Prop 13 came in and said, no more. You can only assess property for taxation based on a historic purchase price. Uh, plus it can go up 2% a year, but the counties cannot just raise taxes every time they come up with a new tax and spend program, which we have been using this law since 1976. And now it's been severely, uh, <laughs> changed because of Prop 19 and not for the positive. So Prop 13 was a voter initiative. It assessed values at 1976 when I started doing income tax return. And it says that whatever you bought the property for is going to be the assessed value. So let's say you bought a house for a million then the property tax will be approximately one to 1.2% of that. And then it can go up 2% per year, no more than that. And Prop 13 was going along well until recently. And there was a lot of uh, tax and spend people wanting to get rid of it. And now they've really cut it back. So, Prop 13 was a, a really good program. So here's the example of how it was working under Prop 13. Let's say you bought a house here in 2005, 100,000, it could go up. Let's say the market value was changing, fine. But for assessment, it could only go up 2% a year. So the second year it was 102, then 104. And it, it basically protected the owner from uh, unreasonable property tax increases. And um, if a property goes down in value, then you can claim that uh, an adjustment with the assessor and your property tax will be assessed lower until the property value comes back. So as I said, you have a base year value and then it goes up 2% a year maximum. But if it drops in value, you get the drop, 
and a lower property tax. Like we had a lot in 2008, the real estate uh, bubble. And then if the property value comes back, then the county's not limited to 2% a year. It goes back up to what it should have been had there not been a, a drop. So if you ever find that you have property fair market value below your assessed value, you should be claiming a discount. So there's a lot of, this one is kind of a warning when you have a change in value and the county is going to be assessing your property and maybe you're trying for a parent child exclusion. Um, whenever you get an assessment, there's a real short statute of limitations of 60 days that you need to file an appeal. And we'll get into some other limitation time periods, but the uh, a preliminary assessment only has a short time to be able to um, to object to it. So another thing when you're, we're gonna go through all the rules, but if you have a transaction, you're really not sure how the tax might come out, you can ask for an advanced ruling through the Board of Equalization. Um, in income tax, we're always dealing with Franchise Tax Board. With real property tax, we have the county assessors, and then above them is the Board of Equalization. So if you find you have a situation you want to get a preliminary ruling on to find out what you might be up against, you can do that. Um, but the suggestion is you don't give them your name and the real property address, and you ask for the ruling, so that if you don't like the ruling, they can't track it when the transaction goes through as easily. Okay, so um, right now for people age 55 and older, there's a recent change where uh, you could always take your old property tax assessment and then buy another house and keep your prior assessment. But before nine, Prop 19, you can only do that within six California counties. With the advent of Prop 19 passing in 2020, uh, effective 2021, now eight, people age 55 and over can sell their old house, buy a new house within certain computational limits, and take their old property tax with them to any new uh, property. And um, in the taxation area, we have a term that they like to use factored base year value, which in income tax is kind of like the word basis. Um, but because this value can change 2% a year, they call it factored because it's not always the same. Okay, so let's say somebody sold their old house, they're over 55, they wanna buy a new house. They're out of real property for half a year or whatever, and then they buy a new property and they can exclude everything if the house is, the market value on the new one is 105% compared to the market value the house sold. So there's some flexibility with that. And it is a slightly, I mean, it is a beneficial provision, the over 55 rule. Um, what happens normally is people over 55 sell their house and move closer to their grandkids. And the average age is 71 when people do that. And they have, <laughs> the law allows them three more times to, to do the same kind of thing. But usually what happens in that age bracket, they sell and buy a new house closer to their grandkids. And then the next sale they do is either a uh, sale and then go into a nursing home or a sale or get buried. So it's a fairly straightforward transaction. You're over 55, you sell, you buy a new house and you keep your old property tax level. 
So this is an example of the over 55 exclusion. You're, you bought the house originally for 100,000, let's say, and you just sold it for 2 million, okay? All right, then you bought it in another location in California for 2 million. So you get to keep your old property tax assessed level, assessment level, and recall that real property is taxed at about one to 1 1.2% of the assessed value or factored base year value. So in this example, people got to keep their same tax, not a bad deal. So in the next example, the uh, people bought a house that was a little bit more expensive than what they sold. So they sold for 2 million, they bought for 2 million and 50,000. So they stepped up in value and that added 50,000 onto their resulting assessment for real property taxes. So when a person does this transaction and wants to move their old property tax assessment to the new property, you have to file a form with the assessor, a claim for a base year transfer to a replacement residence. It's a form BOE 19-B. I have included the form in your information. And in addition to that, you also have to file a homeowner's exemption. And that form is used to be almost worthless. Now it's required for a lot of transactions. And what a homeowner's exemption form is that says, hey, county assessor, I live at this address. I swear under penalty of perjury, I live here. And then they give you 7,000 off your assessment, which is no big deal and it saves you 70 bucks a year, but it is proof to the county that you live at that location to make this transaction work for you. This is a sample of the form, the transfer base year value. It's real simple. Where did you used to live? Where do you live now? What was the sale price of the old one? How much did you pay for the new one? And uh, it gives the county what they need. And if not, they will ask for additional um, documentation. So when Prop 19 passed in the end of 2020, there was a stampede of deeds because everybody knew that the ability to transfer property to your children was going to be impaired. And there were thousands and thousands of deeds prepared where parents were giving their kids title on the property before this law kicked in. And I was amazed at, I mean, thousands of deeds. So I, I call it a stampede. Um, and it was significant. However, I don't think everybody understood what they were really doing entirely because when you, yes, they got the lower property tax for their kids, but they forgot about income tax. So let's say that a parent had bought the house for 100000 They give the house to the kid or kids. Now the kid's basis for gain or loss for income tax is 100000 and if the house is worth $2 million, you just created a huge capital gain. And I think the majority of people that did this to try to beat the law change didn't realize the downside of the built-in capital gains that they were causing their children. The proper thing to do is wait until the parents die. And then you get a step up in basis to market before the property gets distributed to the beneficiaries. So we have a couple different exclusions. One's a parent-child exclusion from reassessment. So what we're trying to do with this is the parents have low property tax assessment. You want to try to give it to your kids 
And um, Prop 19 put a big wrench in problem with that process. And so it goes from parent to child, and it can also go from parent to grandchild if the grandchild's parents are dead and the exclusion can be transferred. It can go the other way too. You can go from child to parent. You don't see that too often. So in property taxation, there's a, a big thing, change of ownership, change of ownership. Well, you sold something, okay, change of ownership. You bought something, okay, change of ownership. You made a gift, yep. Change of ownership, inheritance, yep, change of ownership. You died, guess what? The date of death is the change of ownership. So that's why it says voluntary or involuntary. Dying somewhat, as far as I know, is pretty much involuntary most of the time. So this is the starting point that we start trying to determine and get the tax benefits for the from the parent-child exclusion. And because there's parent to child and parent to grandchild, generically, we're calling it the intergenerational transfers because it covers both. So who can do this to be a child? It can either be natural born child, stepchild, child-in-law, adopted child, foster child. And as I said, it can go from grandparent to grandchild if the grandkids' parents are dead. So several things have to happen to claim this tax benefit, one of which is the property that has been transferred. We're trying to go from parent to child to save taxes, property tax. It has to have been the primary residence of the transfer or. And I think people need to be aware from now on that they have to make sure they file the homeowner's exemption it says I live in this house. It doesn't cost anything to file the form. And in order to claim the parent-child exclusion, there are restrictions as there are in most tax situations. So let's say the surviving spouse dies and now we have a house that's gonna go to the child or ch children. And from one year of the date of death, the child has to agree that they're going to live in the property and file a homeowner's exemption in order to claim this tax benefit. So it, what I recommend in estate planning, let's say there's two or three kids, that while the parents are still alive, they get the kids to agree who's going to live in the house. So there's not a lot of debate and time period. You've only got one year from day to death to get this transaction secured. So if you have it agreed upon ahead of the surviving spouse dying, then you um, can make the transaction take place easier. Okay, so when you have a parent-child exclusion, just to back up overview, what we're trying to do with this thing is get the parents old low property tax after the kid or kids own the house so that it doesn't force them to sell the property. Otherwise, the property tax will go up to assessment of the market value on the date of death. And you don't want that if you want to keep the property. So. You have to file a form to claim the parent-child exclusion or parent-grandchild. And I said you had a year to file the homeowner's exemption, separate form. Now we're talking about a different form called the parent-child exclusion or parent-grandchild. And with this form is the second form you have to file to get the tax benefit. And it must be filed with the assessor within three years of the date of death or transfer, but before you sell the property to another person. So there's some requirements. And 
as I mentioned, if you get an assessment, a supplemental assessment, while these you're trying to do this paperwork, you only have six months to uh, within six months of the supplemental assessment to, to appeal it. Um, and if you mess everything up, and let's say you don't file these transactions until later, um, you can file and try to get the, the parent-child exclusion later, um, but it would not be retroactive. So this is a, an example of the form that you fill out for the county assessor to transfer the assessment requests a transfer from the parent to the child. It talks about who the parent was, the relationship to the child, and details related to uh, the family uh, relationship. And it's, there's not a lot to it. You have to have the parent should have had a, already filed the homeowner's exemption. And the child who's going to live in the house needs to uh, be indicated. And also in addition to this parent child form, you need the homeowner's exemption also being filed. This is the other form to claim a tax benefit from a transfer from grandparent to grandchild the problem with this one that people confuse a lot is that the parents of the grandchild must be deceased or this transaction will not work. So the form itself gets into the details of who the grandparent was, who the, the grandchild is, the life or death status of the parent of the grandchild. These forms are not complicated. What needs to be done is an understanding of how the law works in order to claim the benefit. And if people don't understand that they need to file these forms, they're going to end up with a very uncomfortable tax liability. We see them go up. It can go up 10000 a year in property tax. Well, I don't know about your budget, but that would be a problem for most people an increase in property tax of 10,000 a year. So back on the homeowner's exemption, you're telling the county, all right, I live in this house, it's my main home. It's one of the requirements. When did you acquire it? When did you move in? And that it's your residence. So valuation. Now, we're getting into some of the requirements and limitations after Prop 19 um, made it more difficult for people to give property to their kids. So you have a base year value market, okay, which is what you got assessed on recently. Then at the date of death, you have a market value at the date of death or transfer. And now you can exclude from reassessment only up to $1 million. And I'll show you how that works. And then you get a new assessed value for the old base year value plus a maximum of the 1 million. And I'll get, have an example here. So we have a transfer in 2021, the assessment prior to death was 725. The property had a market value on date of death of 1.5 million. And so what can we exclude here? So we take what we were assessed originally, plus the maximum benefit you can claim is 1.7 million. And since the market value was only 1.5 million, your adjusted basis does not increase. So the child or grandchild here ends up with the same assessed taxable value that the grandparent or the parent had. Now, if you have 
you exceed the maximum allowable under the new limited Prop 19 problems, you had a prior year value of assessed value 382. The market value was 1.8 on the date of death. So we take what we had to start with in the parents tax bill, we add a million, which is the maximum we can claim as a benefit, and we come up with a, a new maximum 1.3 million. But it so happens the house is worth more. So we go from the 1.8 market value less the maximum we can claim exemption from, and we get 417 and change. So adding the original assessment plus the amount that was in excess of the totals, maximums, we had an old assessment from the parents of 382. Now the kid has a new taxable value of 800,000. And this is an example where the property was worth more and they were some of the parties could claim the parent child or parent grandchild and some of the other beneficiaries could not. So it's a little more tedious. The parent had a 250,000 assessed value. The market was 1.5 million. So the maximum excludable possible is, is 1.2 million. And so we have an excess of 250,000 and we have 75% goes to the grandkid, 25% goes to the, the friend and the old assessed value was 250. And after the transfer, the assessed value is 750,000 because the friend doesn't qualify under the parent child or parent grandchild exclusions. Okay, so another scenario that's not unreasonable is you have a prior year base year value assessment of 465. Now we got a house of 225 million and the surviving spouse gets 66% and the son ends up with 33%. So we go through the maximum allowable again from the beginning, the parent had less than maximum benefit. So we get 1.4. And then we go to market less the maximum. We have a potential increase to 759,000. And then you have to factor it out by percentages. The um, the son's calculation ends up with four hundred seven thousand, and the spouse calculation ends up at three hundred ten. So, from four hundred sixty five thousand when husband and wife were alive, to surviving spouse getting the house and son getting thirty three percent, property tax assessment goes up seven hundred and eighteen thousand. I realize this is a lot of numbers, but when you're cutting the checks for these property tax bills, it becomes pretty important. Now, to look at it a different way, perhaps a simpler view is parent had 300,000 assessed value. The maximum benefit you can claim now after Prop 19 closed a bunch of benefits and the maximum excluded is 1.3 million. So on the date of death, the house is worth 1.5 million, less the maximum we can claim. So there's a $200,000 amount in excess of the maximum. So we go original assessment, 300,000, plus the increase, and after death into the beneficiary, now the tax is going to be assessed at 500,000 and they'll pay property tax at about 1 to 1.2% of the uh, the value. So how do you get to claim 
the parent child exclusion. You fill out an application, you give it to the county assessor, you timely file a homeowner's exemption within a year that says, hey, I'm going to live in this house. It's my home now and I'm the new owner. And you have to put a copy of the trust document in with the application and a list of assets so they can compute to see if the uh, cash and non-cash assets uh, work out mathematically. So it, it's just an application process. So we do everything we can to claim this property tax exemption and it's severely restricted after Prop 19. Um, uh, unfortunately. And there are some other rules that go into effect. If you have, um, let's say three children and it goes from parent to the three children and one of the three children decides to live in the house, files a homeowner exemption and they file the parent child exclusion only one of the three children needs to live there for the to carry over the tax benefit. The other two don't. And if that child later moves out, they lose that low property tax exemption forever. Let me give you an example of that. So let's say we do everything right. We get a parent child exclusion for the beneficiary and they're living in the house. And, and so they live there four or five years, there's no minimum requirement. And then they buy another house and claim a homeowner's exemption in another place in California. They just blew it and lost their parent-child exclusion for the house they just moved out of. And what happens is we're trying to keep the parents low property tax assessment. And, and when it's successful, we've got that. Now, when the child moves out, what the assessor does is they have this computation running in the background of market value on date of death plus 2% a year. And they keep that computation going in the background of the computer. And then if a kid moves out, they already know how high to raise the assessment and once that parent-child exclusion is lost because the child moves out, it can never again be reclaimed. It's gone forever. So one thing that beneficiaries can do is sell the real property. Okay, fine. It's not the best thing in my view because you have a low property tax assessment. And then if you sell and, and the other, you buy another property, you end up paying property tax at market value. So you have a situation that causes problems and I'll try to make it as simple as possible. And that is, let's say the parent has a house and no cash and three kids. And the house is going to go from parent to child, okay, or surviving spouse to child. And there's three kids are the only beneficiaries. So if there are no other assets available, two of the kids want cash. So they get a refi on the loan or the new they the beneficiary is going to live there, gets a loan. And what happens is the county treats that as a sale between siblings. There is no sibling to sibling sale. So in that scenario, two thirds of the house would get reassessed to market because there wasn't enough cash to pay the two kids who wanted out of the house their share. So it's a real problem. And there is a legal way around it. It's not that uh, difficult if you know how the rules work. And that is you have the trust 
get a loan on the house before distribution. And then the money is leaned against the house, no distribution yet. And then you give the two children who went out, you give them cash. The kid who lives in the house, their third plus the loan, now they get to stay in the house and they got the full homeowner's exemption. But it's tricky because the money has to be loaned to the trust and none of the beneficiaries can guarantee the loan or it's a sibling transfer, not exempt. And the part of the problem is not very many lenders can do these transactions. So this is the code section that comes up when this problem occurs. And just keep in mind that if you have an illiquid trust or estate that, and you're gonna be dividing property out, there's gotta be enough cash available to give the children who are not ending up with property to pay them off without a, it looking like a sale. So you end up needing to get a lender that a third party lender that will loan to the trust. Now, a lot of people will go to their bank or their mortgage broker that they've always used and you tell them that I need to get a loan against the trust and they'll waste your time because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac do not allow these kind of loans and the brokers that you're dealing with probably don't know it either. So you go through all this paperwork to mess up the transaction that does not make the loan to the trust because the lenders from Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac must make the borrower take the property out of the trust into the individual's name, get the loans in the individual's name, and then put it back in the trust. And when you get done with that, you just blew the whole transaction and it's all taxable. So you have to get a, a special type of lender who's not controlled by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And these are some examples you can look through on how the loan goes, but just keep in mind the overview that if you have an illiquid, illiquid trust, the loan has to be made to the trust and the beneficiaries cannot guarantee or participate in the loan application. It's gotta be for the trust only. And then you can divide up the cash. So beneficiaries cannot get involved. And there are not that many lenders in California that provide this loan, but there are some that specialize that, you know, work with attorneys to get this transaction. And when you get the loan, generally the loan will cost you about $18,000 or so. And they say it takes three years of lower property tax to get your money back. However, what they leave out of that computation is that this lender to the trust wants to get their loan paid off after about three years. So you have another loan cost transaction in a, a reasonably short period of time that, that adds cost to it. But in the long run, it's way better for the beneficiary to get the lower property tax. So who can make the loans? A conventional lender will not work. A family member's okay. Acquiring beneficiary cannot guarantee the loan. Family friend is okay or private money lender. And these loans are generally $450,000, $500,000. So not everybody keeps that in their uh, petty change uh, bank account. So who's allowed to make these loans? Just keep in mind that if you come across a situation where there's a house, several beneficiaries, and an illiquid trust or estate, 
that in order to do the parent-child exclusion, you have to be careful not to create the effect of a transfer between siblings. The loan application process should be reduced. Um, there are times when it's not worth it to get a third party loan. All the beneficiaries wanna sell out, fine. They can do that. They're gonna get lower total distributions as a result from the estate, but it is a possibility. So I'm gonna skip some of the details because they get a little bit tedious. And then after you do this transaction, from parent to child, you got a loan against the trust, you won all the rules and you got a low tax for the beneficiary that's gonna live there. Right after that's done, you can claim the over 55 exemption and sell that property and buy another one and move the, um, the assessed value to the new house that you bought. Okay. Now, this is, I find most people don't know about this little technique in that, especially with uh, couples not being married as much these days, there is an exclusion from reassessment. Let's say boyfriend, girlfriend live in a house for a long time and one of them dies and then the survivor gets the whole house. Well, a lot of times it gets reassessed because of the sale. But with this situation, you if both of them lived in the house at the time of the first one's death, you can claim a complete exclusion as a co-tenant residency. And we have used this very favorably. And I don't ever know remember seeing this in any professional literature. Now, this is my hot button. Prop 19, and you'll see why in a moment. Uh, my view is Prop 19 was the biggest voter fraud event in California history. The ballot was confusing on purpose to entice people to pass it, and they didn't know what they were voting for. I've talked to many people, and no one that I've talked to ever knew what they were voting for because of this tricky wording. So they said, first of all, we're going to help fire victims. Oh, fine. Then we're going to help seniors preserve their lower property tax if they're over 55 to any county. Fine. But they hid the fact that they were going to destroy Prop 13 for the majority of parent-child transfers. And it is a huge tax increase that people didn't know was coming. They were tricked by the wording and the sponsors did it intentionally to help destroy Prop 13. And what happens now is if you cannot qualify the parent-child exclusion, one of the kids cannot live there, you get reassessed. And the net result is that maybe the kids grew up in the house and they're gonna inherit the house but the entire house is gonna get reassessed because of this stupid law. And now the kids can't keep the house. They've got to sell it. And it's horrible. It's, uh, it really limits the uh, abilities for family to keep their property over the long term and forces sale. Well, the firefighter labor groups were involved in this. Uh, writing of the rules because they were having trouble raising additional taxes because only about 3% of their their emergency calls are for fires. And the real estate brokers got involved because they helped trick the rules in it, California Association of Realtors, because now when there's a property tax, a surviving spouse dies, and they can't make the new property tax bill, the property taxes go up 10,000 a year, 
gee, now the house has to be sold. So the realtors are the new ambulance chasers and the realtors are now showing up at the bar association because waiting for someone to die so they can force the sale of their house. And I suggest boycotting members of the California Association of Realtors and local and state government agencies make out like bandits. The nonpartisan um, legislative analyst office predicted that about $2 billion annually are going to be assessed against property tax that are hit by the adverse effect of Prop 19. And to me, it's horrible. I don't agree with fraud in any way. And this was a huge voter fraud that people did not know they were voting for. And it's going to cause, like, say you have a property owners that have a primary house, several rental properties. Now with Prop 19, every all the property values are going to go up. All the property taxes are going to go up. And let's say a rental property in a low income area that the family's been able to offer low income housing, now it's going to get reassessed and they're not going to be able to keep it in the rental pool. Now they're going to have to sell the house and then the young rich people will come in and buy it and it helps gentrify the neighborhoods and reduces the pool of low income housing. Um, I think the people that were putting this um, voter fraud together ought to go to jail. Um, now families create a great deal of tax when one of the, the surviving spouse dies and they have more value than the limited um, 1 million exclusion that happened after Prop 19. So, and, and this is some of the deception that was put in. This is actual wording in the California constitution now to, to demonstrate the trickery that was used on the voters. While eliminating unfair tax loopholes used by East Coast investors, celebrities, wealthy non-California residents, trust fund heirs, avoiding their fair share of property tax on vacation homes, income property, and beachfront rentals they own in California. Guess what? They're trying to say that rich people ought to get taxed like crazy, and this affects the middle class front and center to the point of one to two billion dollars a year in increased property tax. And their example demonstrates the fraud on the voters, in my view. But what do I know? So let's change subjects a little bit and cover another topic, estate and inheritance tax. In we used to do a whole lot of inheritance tax returns. When I started, you got inheritance tax if you had assets over 600,000. And we used to do a lot of them. But now the inheritance tax level is so high that we don't do that many of them anymore. So what types of inheritance tax? California, we only have federal. Fine. California, we don't have an inheritance tax, but this Prop 19 is like one. And then gift tax is federal only. Keep in mind, though, that when we say there's no inheritance tax in California, other states have inheritance tax. So don't keep your computation narrow. So what happens if you've got a very large estate you're going to have a high inheritance tax, but it's not that big of a deal. In, in 2021, your one person had to have over 11.7 million. In 2022, it's over 12 million. So what are we talking about? And, and a couple is 24 million. So your client or you have to have over 1.11 million. $12 million, and the amount of fair market value above that gets taxed at 37%. Well, guess what? 
less than 1% of the people in the US have that kind of wealth. So when I'm explaining estate and inheritance tax to people, it ends up being an explanation of how it works and it really does work that way. And then the net result is it doesn't apply to you so it's no big deal, forget about it. And the fair market value of all assets on the date of death is computed for that 12 million per person. Uh, other states, as I mentioned, have um, inheritance tax. There's a, a big problem with non-citizen spouses that over, if they have if they inherit over 250,000, they get the huge inheritance tax. So just realize in a red flag that if you're trying to do an estate plan for someone who's a non-citizen, be really careful. You might have to create one of these qualified domestic trusts, QDOC, and it's a lot of problems. And that's why a lot of people I've done estate plans for, we do the qualified domestic trust and they don't like it because they're going to get taxed like crazy and they hurry up and get their citizenship done. Um, you may have heard the term AB trust, a survivor trust, decedent's trust. That whole process came about back when inheritance tax was assessed at lower levels. And we still have tax returns we're doing where we have AB trust and uh, the technique still works if need be, if your assets are over 12 million. There's another concept in inheritance, state inheritance tax. Each spouse gets 12 million exclusion, fine. If the spouse who dies doesn't use their full 12 million, then if you file an estate tax return, you can take the amount left over and add it to the surviving spouse. Example, let's say the couple has 18 million of, of taxability of market value. And so we do an estate tax return on the amount above 12. So we show an inheritance tax return for 600 or 6 million. So to get up to the 12 million, 6, was not, 6 million was not used. So for the surviving spouse, we take their 12 million and we add the six to it. So when the second spouse dies, we can exclude up to 18 million. Did I lose everybody on that one? I think so. But that is called portability. Now, the tax return is not all that complicated. There's volumes written about it. Right now, it's a dead horse. Okay, so if you had $100 million of value of assets on the date of death, you subtract out 12 million for the exclusion, and then you pay inheritance tax at 37% on the amount above the exclusion. And you end up having to get appraisals on all the property so we know an accurate um, market value on the date of death real property, stocks and bonds. And we usually fill out the real estate schedules and the securities schedules. Um, so just know that it exists. Oh, there's another thing I hear a lot about. I go, oh, if you give over 16,000 a year, you got to get a gift tax return. True statement. But it doesn't really apply to anybody unless your fair market value of your assets is over 12 million then it applies. So don't worry about that gift tax exclusion. And the, although the rule does say you have to file a gift tax return for gifts over 16 million or 16,000, but there's no tax due when that form is filed. Okay. So we need to conclude here and we've covered quite a bit in terms of real property tax, how it works, when it works, what the exclusions, how to get tax benefits. And we covered loans on real property and some things about deeds and how deeds work. Um, 
We have other things available you may want to look at, a comprehensive estate planning book. We have videos on our YouTube channel, Estate Planning California, and we keep adding to it all training uh, technical material. And we have a newsletter on our one of our websites, taxrexcrandell.com. So with that, I think I can't really say any more. And I think that uh, we ought to wrap this up. So what I'd like to do is open the floor for questions. If awesome. there are any questions. Thank you so much. Awesome presentation as usual. And yes, there are questions here. So uh, the first one, is there a limit on the assessment reduction for the 55 and older disabled of only 1 million on the new house? purchase? Uh, there are some requirements. If somebody has some special disabilities or disabled veterans, I can't quote them off the top of my head. Um, I would have to look into the detail on it, but there, there is some uh, benefit there. Okay. And then also, once a parent dies, in order for the child to qualify for the parent-child exemption, do we know how long the child must reside in the parent's home to receive the parent-child exclusion? Okay, that is a very frequent question. They say, okay, well, I'm going to live there a while, then I'm going to move out. Well, guess what? You blew it. What it says is, as long as the child continues to make that their principal residence, there's no minimum, there's no maximum. But if you move out or buy another property and claim another homeowner's exemption, it'll fail on the original parent-child exclusion and it can never be recovered. And as I mentioned, the county will take what it should have taxed had you not claimed that and add 2% a year. So after you move out the next year, you got to pay the higher property tax. But the real answer to your, I know the question, I want to live there for a while and move out. Well, the county assessors are not too excited. I can tell because I've talked to some of them that they're going to be chasing around people seeing who lives there. They're going to be using the form called the homeowner's exemption to determine whether you live there or not. And the county assessors also have the MLS and a confidential remark. So when there's a transaction, they say house is sold, it's being bought, they know it's vacant don't think that they don't know what's going on in the real estate transaction but the net re the answer to the question is how long do you have to live there the real answer is as long as you want to continue to claim that tax benefit okay all right you guys go ahead and continue to type your questions in the q a uh, we have a little bit more time the next question is, is the reassessment exemption for the 55 still limited to six counties? Uh, no, Proposition 19 changed the six county limitation to the entire 58 counties in the state. <laughs> okay. For the Prop 19 exemption forms, do you have to submit the entire trust or the certification of trust? I'm finding more and more that no institution likes the certification of trust, even though they say that you can use it. <laughs> they just want to know, they want the whole trust. Okay. All righty. And why can't one sibling, the one staying in the house, take the loan, pay off the other siblings, and still keep the exemption instead of loaning to the trust? Okay, the way that it is structured, and this is not really a new law, we have the parent-child exclusion but there has to be enough assets in the trust to make this split between some get dirt, some get cash. And if there's not enough money so that some get dirt and some get cash, 
the beneficiaries being involved in the loan makes it a sibling to sibling transfer. So that's why you have to back up and get the loan in the trust before distribution. Now we say, oh, well, that property had a loan on it and we had another 600,000, gee. And the kid that ends up with the house gets the loan that was created in the trust. So what you're trying to avoid is the beneficiaries getting involved in any of the lending or it's not gonna work. Okay. All righty, here's another one. How can you get your ruling with the board if you don't give name and address? Can you explain a bit more? Yeah, it's called anonymous. You say, well, hypothetically, uh, we're going to, uh, we might buy this house over here in uh, Tehachapi and we might, you know, be, if, if these parents die, we're going to get another uh, house over in Mojave and uh, we want to know how these numbers work out and you don't tell them the detail and you might not even use your own name you might use a relative's name so you're getting a letter back stating that you get a preview of what they are what their view would be but you're not binding yourself you don't want that in case you decide to not follow their suggestion okay and is there any capital gains tax on the Prop 19 example? Capital gains tax on Prop 19. The problem with Prop 19 is it's going to force two, one to two billion of properties to be sold because of um, they can't afford the property tax anymore. So that is going to create capital gains all over the place. But if you, on the date of death, you get reassessed at market, if you sell reasonably close to the date of death, there's no gain or loss because the property hasn't changed that much because of this step up basis. But um, in order to have a capital gain, on a after a death of a part person the property gets stepped up to market on date of death and then the property has to go up for there to be a gain in the future sale okay all righty that is it for all of the questions did you guys have any additional questions you want to put in the q a we have about 15 more minutes um if you have anything else, um, feel free to um, put your questions in there. Um, if uh, some of you would actually not like to ask your question instead of typing it, I can go ahead and allow you to talk as well. Um, here's a question on the exam. The, the exam will be posted today uh, is the question. Will the exam be posted today? The exam today? is available now. It's 100 questions. You need to get 70% to pass. We've included a sheet in with the class material online. Open that up and read it. It tells how it works. It's a multiple choice exam. And as you go through the exam, you pick, you know, A, B, C, or D, and then you hit next and it says, you got it right or you got it wrong. And then it lets you go. It doesn't, it, it doesn't give you the answer and let you take forward. What I, we're suggesting is everybody take a pencil and paper and write down their answers as they go, just in the outside chance they don't pass at the 70% level and they need to take it over. So then they can go back and look up the examples of the answers they got wrong. But it is a multiple choice. It's completely automated. As long as you get 70%, you click send and it's done. If you get less than 70%, you're going to hit send and it's going to go thud and you're <laughs> going to go back to the drawing board. Okay. Um, can, can we open the exam no later than January the 15th? Okay. The way the exam works, it's available today and it's available to be completed from now until January 15th. 
what we wanted to do was not get a lot of complaints saying, oh, I was busy, I had the holidays, couldn't do it. Okay, fine. You can do it tomorrow. You can do it next week. You can do it January 7th. Don't plan on it January 16th. It's not going to be there. Okay. All right. So you got a whole month. So take your time, do however you want. We wanted to make it easy for everyone. Okay. All righty. Is form BOE58 uh, probate form DE147 included in the materials for this class? I don't see those. Uh, say the numbers again. I'll try. DE-147. DE-137. See, I don't memorize the numbers because I'm kind of an alphanumeric person. Um, I don't know what that form is. I have a BOE-19, a 19P. Go ahead, Colleen. Yeah, Rex, it's on the homework and it says it's on one of the assignments. It says prepare a claim for reassessment exclusion for transfer between parent and child form BOE-58 and probate form DE-147. But I looked okay. through the- Got it, got it. Okay, I understand the question. Thank you, Colleen. Yeah. Um, Colleen Marie. Um, what we have for parent-child, they changed the number. It's a 19P now, and I did include it. So there's, I included the parent child, which they have a new number, and the parent grandchild with the new number, and then the homeowner's exemption that's part of that. I, it looks like BOE 266. So to answer your question, the specific numbers you're asking for are not there. To answer your question, the forms that we're talking about are there with the new BOE numbers. Okay. All right. Uh, is there a deadline for homework? Yes. January 15th. Okay. All right. What we're going to do is, okay, you're going to pass the test. No problem. Then we have, we're working on a, uh, a beautiful certificate, a wall certificate that you might want to get laminated. We've got artwork for it. It's really awesome. And if you don't want a laminated certificate, you can get yours in paper rolled up in a tube and we'll send it to you. That's fine also at no charge. The uh, laminated version of the certificate is 125. We have a vendor prepare it and it gets shipped to you and it's in a wall plaque that will last 30 years. And um, what we're going to also require is after you pass the exam, we'll send you an affirmation form like on the Calva site where it says, yes, I watched the videos under penalty of perjury. And this form will say, yes, I did all my homework. So more details to follow. Don't worry about anything. Just pass the final. Awesome. All right, uh, will you be offering the course through CALDA again? This course is being created within a program called Thinkific. So it's going to become an, a wrapped up course within a software where you can join and start any time. Start and finish, start and finish all the way through. The answer is yes, and it's going to be an on-demand course and that we will add to it, but we have no plans to give any further live courses, although we might. So the answer to the question is, yes, it will be given, It's and it will become an on-demand course instead of uh, live. Okay. Is the estate planning book offered by your firm available for purchase and what price? Okay. We don't sell anything. This, in this video, I mean, on the, uh, it says epilogue page, it gives you the link to go to Amazon and you can buy the book on Amazon. It's sold on Amazon. We don't get involved in it. So they oh. print it, they ship it. Awesome. And um, can you, the, for the exam, can it be started? Can you start it, leave it, and then come back to it? Yes. And you, it goes back to the place you left off. 
Okay, great. And will certification be available? For, oh, I think we asked that for the future courses and, and you asked that already, it would be uh, available through Thinkific. Right, so the uh, Certified Estate Planner program is going to become enveloped in software so that it's on demand and people can start and stop at any time. And it, it will be available through us and through more likely through Calda. Okay. All righty, you guys, this has been wonderful, a wonderful program. Um, no more questions. I think everybody is excited to go and hop on and start their exam. Yeah, don't and lose pass. any sleep tonight though. <laughs> and pass with flying colors. Oh yeah, um, no problem. So thank you again very much. Everyone is is um, is singing your praises and, and thanking you, Professor Rex. Uh, this was very uh, informational for all of us. So it was very fun for me to prepare, but I'll tell you, it was way more work than I had ever dreamed of. Oh, oh it's a lot of work. I mean, I, it taken over our office. Unbelievable. <laughs> now now it's all done so yeah. now, now the hard part is done yep it is all great. righty take fun. care everyone have a great evening um talk to you soon okay bye. all right bye-bye